We're at part seven now, the blood vessels of the cardiovascular system on page 710. We were looking at pulse points, and I wanted to make a point here uh, about coming across a uh, person when you're working in um, emergency medicine that uh, is of potential importance. Uh, sometimes you'll come across somebody who is not conscious, and um, you're checking to see if they're how they're doing. And uh, you might grab the wrist and try to get a pulse here, but if they don't have a mean arterial blood pressure of 80, then they won't have a pulse here because this requires uh, a mean arterial blood pressure of 80. It's pretty low, and um, some people might actually have a, a blood pressure 90-something over 60-something, and even if they're still conscious and awake and speaking to you, uh, they're not going to have a pulse right there. It's going to be a... It's going to be a very weak system indeed, uh, but they'll have a pulse here, and that's because over here um, we have a, a mean arterial blood pressure requirement of only 50 millimeters of mercury. So as long as you can find a pulse here, place your ear to the chest and you hear a heartbeat, that's always a good sign. So um, that means your patient is alive, but they have low blood pressure, and if there's a pool of blood anywhere nearby, you might suspect that they have uh, lost a lot of blood, and so lack of blood volume is the cause of um, low blood pressure. Okay, so um, we come through the book here. Um, they identify homeostatic balance and imbalance. They say that uh, this is something that uh, I think some doctors are really beginning to object to, and I actually wrote the word naughty here. <laughs> but um, normal blood pressure um, for uh, resting adults um, uh, is a systolic pressure, they say here, of less than, and that's an important deal, not equal to, but less than 120, uh, and a diastolic pressure of less than uh, 80, and particularly 80 would be naughty. Uh, we can vary the top end quite a bit because um, if we get a little bit more stressed or if we're, um, I don't know, uh, how shall I say, energized by really anything at all. The 120 end top end here could be quite variable, uh, but the bottom end will always be what it is. So um, your heart rests where it in fact can rest. So it should be below 80 at the bottom end here. And if this one is up at 124 or something like that, and this one is at 78 or 77, that's fine. Okay, you just have a, a wider pulse pressure because you've had some emotion lately. Uh, hypertension then is anytime we get to, and here historically we've been using, uh, what is it, uh, 140 over 90, but that's gotten to be, how shall I say, old school, and really 120, anything over 120 over 80 is considered the new standard, uh, pretty much. Uh, when they talk about uh, primary hypertension here, that's the next topic on page 711, um, they begin right here, and um, so let's let's sort of look into this topic just a little bit and uh, try to make sense of this. Uh, it says, although uh, hypertension and um, atherosclerosis are often linked, uh, quite often to each other, it's often difficult to blame uh, hypertension on any distinct um, anatomical pathology. Um, it says, indeed, about 90% of um, hypertension, hypertensive people have a primary or essential hypertension. Now, this can be misleading because there are many things that lead to hypertension. And what they're trying to say here is that uh, in most people who have hypertension, certainly 90%, one cannot point to a single thing. And uh, we have a, uh, a little discussion that we're going to get into with regard to uh, metabolic syndrome, which has actually uh, at least four or five usual characteristics that are uh, identified as part of the problem for hypertension, and they're listing a number of them right here. Uh, but usually the uh, metabolic syndrome is acquired through uh, lifestyle changes. And it was in 2002 that we were, um, how shall I say, advised by the CDC and by the Surgeon General of the United States, both at different times in the year 2002, advised us that um, 
uh, lifestyle changes and metabolic uh, syndrome were the really primary uh, issues at play in modern American healthcare. And um, the uh, World Health Organization, somewhere in the vicinity of 2011 or 2013, I think it was 2011, made the same declaration. Okay, so heredity, of course, makes a difference. And I would also measure heredity in terms of, um, how shall I say, uh, what what uh, personalities were inherited, shall we say. Okay, so if we're living in a family in which uh, people tend to regularly um, <laughs> boil over and have, uh, how shall I say, very intense arguments with one another, um, then that's a kind of heredity, if you if you will, in which the child is not necessarily um, uh, biologically connected to that, um, but in a sense they are because they're living in that environment. Okay, so heredity can also play a role by a number of different features, <clears throat> not the least of which is um, difficulty with cholesterol. Uh, there can be diets uh, that are at play. There can be sedentary uh, qualities that are uh, normal to a certain family life. So uh, biology is going to be playing some role and, um, of course, nurture will be playing some role in all of that. So uh, we what we practice as a body is a, a rather behavioral uh, identity can play a role. Children who are encouraged to become athletic or active in any way whatsoever are more likely to be able to um, have a uh, uh, an ability to regulate a little bit better. Okay, the um, the diet plays a role as I indicated that uh, hypertension can be a factor uh, from the development of atherosclerosis and plaque and uh, advanced glycosylated glycosylation end products are something that we're going to study in the diabetology paper. Obesity, of course, is that uh, aspect of the metabolic syndrome. It's one of the five principles that uh, causes uh, metabolic syndrome. So that plays a role, increased peripheral resistance. Age uh, will increase uh, the probability that one is gaining some weight uh, because of the decline in metabolic um, uh, abilities. So uh, hypertension uh, usually uh, appears, it says, uh, after the age of 40, and uh, people are in some ways not necessarily paying close attention to uh, their physical well-being uh, as much as possible, um, that we're having a decline in organ function of every imaginable type after 40, and so one does have to pay very much more close attention to uh, diet and exercise and sleep in order to overcome uh, the changes. Uh, diabetes is a major factor, and we'll go over that in our, our paper. Stress is a major factor, and so people who have strong responses uh, can have sympathetic, uh, how shall I stray, say, stressors uh, that cause blood pressure to zoom. Smoking, as it turns out, is a factor in the constriction peripheral resistance and uh, constriction of blood vessels. And uh, so there's, there's going to be uh, that contribution. So when they talk about here primary hypertension and that it doesn't have a cause, what they're really saying is that this person does not have uh, a pathology or a disease to which hypertension is secondary. So what they're trying to say is that primary hypertension means that this person is hypertensive from their very uh, immediate state of their physiology. Their anatomy and their physiology uh, is bringing about this primary disease. It's not secondary to another disease. So don't let... Don't let this definition of saying that there's no cause uh, for primary hypertension. All of these are causes of primary hypertension. What they're saying um, up here, though, in this disclaimer, is that primary hypertension is not secondary to another disease. And that's an important detail. One could say that uh, primary hypertension is secondary to metabolic syndrome. Uh, and that's because metabolic syndrome is really the accumulation of all these things. 
So we'll go on to the next step here.